Good morning again, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Kelly, CEO for LGS Innovations, and it is uh, my distinct honor and privilege, privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Evan Glazier, who is uh, and has been the principal of Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. He loves teaching and learning and dreaming, and after all, a lot of what gets us inspired about STEM is dreaming about the art of the possible. He and his wife have two kids, and both of them look forward someday to uh, one of their kids or both of their kids inventing something that's going to make their lives a little bit easier. Dr. Glazier wanted me to tell you that. Uh, since this is a STEM education event, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few words about his education. Dr. Glazier is uh, among the fighting Illini. He got his Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics and Master's of Science in, in Mathematics Education from the University of Illinois and earned his Ph.D., in inst instructional technology at the University of Georgia. So without further ado, my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Glazier. Sir, the floor is yours. Yeah? Oh, there we go. There we go. Thanks, Kevin. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, so... Um, for any of you who came to the presentation to uh, learn about Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, I, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you that actually that's, that won't be what my presentation is about. But there's tons of kids uh, who are here who go to TJ and who are giving exhibits, and I saw some of the ice cream, homemade ice cream. Those, that was created by uh, a group from TJ, so there's lots of TJ kids here to learn a lot about the school, and certainly I can tell you a lot about it um, as we interact. Um, but uh, when I was asked to give a presentation, uh, you know, the topic was, hey, let's, uh, why don't you come up uh, with a topic that uh, you would find really fun. And of course, I love talking about my school, but I also love talking about other things, and I love to dream about the future and about what uh, kind of potential is there. And I also love to give presentations that have full audience engagement or as much as I can possibly get. So you should... Um, so, so this is like, this, this presentation requires participation. Um, and there's prizes. You probably heard it in the hallway, too. That may have been, they, that may have been the sole motivator for coming. But um, so you should, everyone should get a packet that has A, B, C, and D as letters. And it's going to go around to every single person that goes in the room. It doesn't matter your age. Uh, you, everyone gets a chance to participate. So... Um, I wanted to, uh, in fact, you know, some people could say, well, you know, why don't you have us participate by using our cell phones or whatever? And uh, many of you may know that, you know, anytime you subscribe to a service or, you know, they track who you are and then they follow up with you. So I really wanted to keep this kind of low tech uh, and uh, protect your identity um, as you participate. So I just made a bunch of uh, copies of A, B, C, and D, and then I'm going to ask certainly for some help from uh, Bryn and some other folks to kind of figure out what, uh, what selections people are making um, and having good estimations of that. All right, so um, my topic is jobs that need to be invented. And as we, as we uh, let's see, do I go this way, this way? Which way do I... Towards you, okay. Oh, there we go. All right, so uh, STEM jobs, science, technology, engineering jobs, and math jobs, uh, related jobs, they're constantly evolving, right? So, um, uh, you know, you can read reports that those people who are in school right now uh, will be pursuing careers that haven't been invented. And some people speculate that's as many as two-thirds of uh, you know, current students will be in careers that have yet to be invented, and so we really rely on thinking about the future and the possibilities, and the students in the audience will be inventing these careers. So take a look at, you know, these are some careers that uh, didn't exist when I was in high school, and actually, you know, some of these have been invented in just the last few years. So there's a, sen there's a sense that, you know, we have to think about what the future is in store for us. Oops, sorry, let's go this way. Okay, so some people may say, well, what jobs are currently in, in the greatest demand right now? 
So what are existing jobs? Where is there a um, huge demand and need? So, um, you know, this was a, a study that was done uh, in 2015 and just trying to get projections and growth rate. And you can see biomedical engineering is certainly a job in great demand. But there's many others that are in high demand. And some people may say for the, the younger people, what do biomedical engineers do? So they're people who create devices and integrate computer systems and software in healthcare. And it's in such high demand because we have an aging population. You know, a lot of uh, people were born, there's a huge boom uh, in birth rate right after World War II. And uh, those are called the baby boomers. And uh, those people are getting at an age where they need more sustained health care. And certainly, um, being inventive is very supportive to the advancement in supporting students, or excuse me, uh, adults and aging populations. So if you were thinking right now, hey, I'm graduating college, I'm going into college, and I want like a guaranteed job security, certainly uh, biomedical engineering is one possible field. But of course, for our students, we want them to pursue something that they're excited about. It's not just about, hey, where do we need jobs? And I'm um, so glad that so many of our younger kids are here to be, uh, you know, to feel excited about different types of STEM professions. So um, I want to talk before I go into possible STEM careers about predicting the future. So um, we have seen, you know, through television or through movies that uh, historically some people have predicted the future actually quite accurately. Um, through a variety of shows. So the upper left-hand corner, you have uh, the movie Minority Report. And in that movie, they, at the time, they were saying, hey, you know, um, advertising will be personalized. So wherever you go, uh, there will be systems that will be responsive to your own interest, and they'll know who you are. And, and that means of detection, actually, was through a sensor of your, of your eye. Um, the Jetsons. So um, some of the parents in the audience may have seen the Jetsons. So that was circa uh, 1962, I think, and um, played, you know, all through the 70s, and you can find it online. Um, anyhow, that was a uh, prediction of what will the world look like 100 years later, and uh, what was the standard family life. And at that time, they were thinking, you know, you'd be able to communicate and call people by video, and that's, uh, that's far, that's been invented. Uh, pro probably all of our students may not even realize that that's fairly new um, because they've experienced that their whole life. All right, then uh, HAL 9000 is the uh, artificial intelligence-based computer from uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, and that came out in the late 60s, and that was really projecting by the year 2001. And it was a little late. It happened a little bit later that um, you had computers that were intelligent enough to communicate. Uh, and there's... Um, home computers, you know, that, or on your phone. People use Siri and people use, uh, um, what's the Amazon one called? Alexa, and there's, there's more, there's others, right? You have devices at home that talk to you and um, provide you information. And HAL, um, you know, turned out to be um, a little bit more than an information provider um, and actually became, you know, uh, well, watch the movie. I'm not going to tell you what happened, okay? But it's a classic, 1968 or something like that. Uh, and then there's Back to the, back to the Future. Uh, you know, so that was circa, what, early 80s. And that was really projecting a future that um, looked at virtual reality and being able to put on a headset and kind of immerse yourself in a completely different experience. And we have that available. You see that um, is now becoming more and more popular, particularly in gaming. Okay, and then there's some uh, historical scientists who came up with some amazing predictions. So uh, Tesla predicted Wi-Fi and mobile phones in 1909. So that was a man far ahead of his time. And uh, Arthur Clarke, imagine the iPad. So this is also in uh, uh, Space Odyssey, 2001 Space Odyssey. And he envisioned the iPad. So there's a picture, there's a snapshot from the movie, and you can actually see that. 
So then you have, so you have some people who have done a remarkable job predicting things that were fairly accurate about the future, and then you have plenty of people, oh, actually before I get to that, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the future. So uh, Ray Kurzweil, um, in the uh, early 21st century, talked about the singularity. Um, so a lot of people have heard of IBM. Uh, Watson is a, a machine that is, um, sur can surpass and challenge any human intelligence. Um, and Ray Kurzweil wrote about uh, this idea of a singularity, a moment in time in which machine intelligence will surpass that of human intelligence. Uh, even to the point where it will be di more difficult to, to distinguish humans from machines. Now, I don't know if I uh, uh, believe all of that because I think what humanizes us is our emotion. You know, is our, uh, this idea of humanity is this ability to have kind of a, a sense of a spirit in a heart um, and compassion and, and emotions that create the human condition. It's not just about how smart you are but how you interact with humanity and how you make the world a better place. And machines actually will be able to make the world a better place, but I don't know if they'll have the capacity to feel, and I, and I don't know, if, I, I do believe they'll still be distinguishable even though they continue to advance. So Moore's Law is an example that illustrates advancement. Now that's a logarithmic scale on the left-hand side on the vertical axis. So if it wasn't logarithmic, uh, you would see this exponential curve going up. And as part of this, uh, you can see that the evolution of technology shows that you can put twice as much uh, computing power every two years on a, um, you know, on a computer chip. And so uh, historically, uh, there's just been this gradual evolution of technology that shows every two years you can double your capabilities. Okay, so um, even though there's all these trends and people have done a great job predicting the future, there are plenty of people who haven't predicted the future accurately. So when we hear predictions such as my own, you have to take them a little with a grain of salt. Um, so you can see in popular mechanics in the early 50s predicting that everyone at home in the future would have helicopters that they can just pull out of their driveways. Um, in the uh, uh, 70s, there was a prediction that, hey, by the mid-80s, we're going to have these uh, automated automobiles. Now, that may happen in the future, but not by the mid-80s. These noiseless, uh, noiseless pneumonic uh, subways and luxury liner hovercrafts to radically restructure our surface mobility. That may happen in the future, but definitely not by the mid-1980s. And then uh, here's a prediction from the late uh, 19th century. Check this one out at the top. Teaching by electrocution. Just instill the fear in students to motivate them. Look at the second one. Flying firemen. It doesn't matter where your fire is. People are just launch into the air to uh, save people. And uh, look at Roomba. Someone had predicted the Roomba uh, in, the late, uh, in 1899. You know, the Roomba is this robotic uh, uh, vacuum cleaner that's going to clean your house. So they had a machine apparatus to do that. So, um, and then look at this big one. Everyone thought that Apple was going to be a complete disaster. These are all, look at all these quotes about people in the mid-90s who thought, uh, and this, I think, you know, Steve Jobs has a great uh, graduation speech at Stanford that talks about um, his experience with failure and how, what he had to do to uh, recover, but you know he was in the midst of uh, a lot of people not believing in what he was able to do, and certainly um, people were wrong. So um, I say all this because I have some ideas of what some great jobs would be in the future, and some of these I'm going to be right, some of them I'm going to be wrong, and I'm actually going to uh, ask you for your input on where you think uh, would be the best jobs for the future, and that's going to come up. So there's four criteria that I think about future jobs. Number one, there's problems in the world galore that um, impact uh, humanity in many ways. So uh, some people are driven to create careers that will s address significant problems. Second, people are driven to create uh, uh, aspects of jobs to personalize something that's useful for them, that's going to help them 
Um, it, so if you ha can realize that you can help people individually, they'll be motivated to buy a product. The third characteristic is, uh, you know, I think in watching a fair amount of science fiction in my life, I enjoy that genre, uh, you start believing that uh, science fiction is science that is yet to be discovered. And some of the science fiction turns out to be far-fetched, but some of it actually uh, it can be true based on advancements of uh, computing power and advancements in thinking. And the last is having an understanding of research. So I feel uh, very, very fortunate to be in an environment that has 14 different strands of research, and I see students doing some of the most cutting-edge work that is very, very inspiring. And as you, fo as you think about research that people are working on, it's ultimately going to lead to jobs, you know? It's going to lead to uh, people doing really neat things. So those are the four fundamental principles I think of when creating a job. And so now we're going to um, ask you to um, participate in you thinking of what's going to be the best job. So I have another handout that's coming your direction. Okay, so it's March Madness. And being March Madness, uh, we're going to create a Sweet 16. And as part of this Sweet 16, um, everyone gets one copy. And if you have a pen, that's going to help you. But if you don't have a pen, then use some mobile device or whatever to keep track. And we're going to create this grid system. So that, and this is where your voting comes into play. Okay? So it's essentially you're creating your own Sweet 16 STEM tournament. Actually, I've determined who the players are. And there probably could be some other players. You know how when you get into a tournament, some people argue that someone got kind of, what do they call those people that were left out that really deserved to be in there? You know, the people on the bubble. What do they call them? I don't know. Oh. Yeah, right. People getting robbed, right? So, th so I'm going to come up with 16 different careers, and you can actually see them on that, on that handout. And it's not like I went to a website and looked these up. I, was, I just thought it would be fun to dream. Like, what are some careers based on those four principles of, that we really need in our future, okay? And I may not have thought of some. Those people got robbed. Those people were on the bubble. Uh, it could have been an oversight. So we're just going to stick with, this is like my sweet 16, but you get to choose ultimately who's going to win each round. Okay, and that's what makes this interactive. So that's coming up. I'll get to that in just a minute. Okay, so in order for you to determine winners in this Sweet 16 tournament, you just have to think about what, uh, what's most important to you. So this is going to turn out to be, there isn't seeding here. It's actually which criterion do you think is most important in a great STEM job that needs to be created. Some of you are going to think about, I want to save the world. I, I'm very much in, in promoting uh, humanitarian needs. Some of you want to promote equity. Some of you want to earn a good salary. Some of you are concerned about ethics. Some of you just want to create something that's going to be fun and entertaining. Some of you want to save people you love or save things you love. Some of you just want to have a great quality of life. There are all different criteria. So what I want you to think to yourself before you enter this tournament is... Which criterion is most important to you for a STEM job in the future? And you can think of, like, for my child, for humanity, however. But it's the, it's, I want you to think of one single criterion that will make it easier for you to make decisions. And I'm not going to influence you in any way. It's up to you on which criterion you would like to think about when evaluating job A with job B. Okay? So think to yourself... As I'm choosing which job is better than others, I've got to use one criterion. I realize it could be a lot more complex, but um, for purposes of our 45 minutes together, uh, you choose just one criterion, and that's going to help you in this elimination tournament, at least until the final four. Once we get to the final four, you'll see that your participation is necessary. Okay? And there's my, so you're probably wondering, like, who's that person celebrating the future of careers? That's my son, Luke. Yeah, I think he wants to engineer the best cupcake possible. Yeah, he just turned three. That was, his, that was from his birthday party. <clears throat> okay, so in your mind you have, hey, this is the best criterion. Now, you don't have to fill out your grid yet because they're going to go through every single one of these. But in your mind, think, hey, this is the best criterion. Okay, and some people ask me, what job would I want to have? 
if I could change my job. So at our school, we had a chance to, to choose which job we want for one day. If you can't tell, I'm the one on the left. So I hail from uh, Chicago, and that picture was taken last October, in the middle of October, uh, in the midst of the playoff run, and um, being over 100 years of being, uh, not being a winner, it was certainly an exciting time, and I think I even had some divine influence from one of our teachers to help me out. So that I was the, uh, I dressed up as the manager of the Chicago Cubs. All right, here we go. So here's how the rules of this game uh, occur. You're going to see a grid. They're all listed there, okay? I'm going to go through A, B, C, and D, and you're going to choose the winner of each bracket, okay? So this is our first bracket, and I'll go through each job. Uh, and these are titles, again, that I made up. By all means, they probably are more sophisticated titles, but I'll explain my reasoning behind each one, okay? So first, Cognition and Memory Enhancer. This would be, uh, as we study and understand the complexity of the brain, it's becoming, you know, we're, we're evolving our understanding as a result of computational capabilities and also uh, EEG interfaces. And so as that advances, we'll, we'll, I believe that we'll start having a better understanding of how to utilize our brain in different ways that we haven't used before. And you, can, you see, like, there's advertisements on how to do this and so forth, but I think it's going to get actually much more sophisticated. And certainly Limitless is uh, an example of how someone has extraordinary brain capacity, and there's all sorts of ethical uh, issues in that uh, particular movie. It's a good watch. But uh, I do believe that uh, there will be scientists working on how we can maximize the use of our brain where we don't feel uh, limited in our cognitive function, okay? So that's A. A is now matched up against B, the body engineering and design specialist. And the body engineering and design, the engineering may be, hey, someone has experienced a uh, significant injury and needs to be reconstructed in a way that they have human function. In fact, they may supersede human function. Some of you may be familiar with Lee Majors and the $6 million man. And then the design aspect, I think, will be intriguing to people. People put designs on their body through tattoos, but they're not yet, uh, or in a limited capacity, thinking about design of enhancing their body um, or making it look uh, particularly interesting, like this young man whose prosthetic limb is a uh, stormtrooper. So I think, uh, I, I believe that in mechanical engineering, interfaced with um, medicine or orthopedics will have the ability to function on engineering and design with body parts. Okay, so you vote on your own sheets. Hey, which of those, based on the one criterion that you have selected, would be a, uh, the better career or the more important career, however you want to um, define that. All right, now I'm going to move on to C. So C is going to go up against D. So C is nanorobotics medicine. And uh, it can serve in multiple capacities. One is, you know, uh, uh, destroying cancerous cells, you know, going in. And instead of thinking of uh, chemical treatments uh, or laser treatments that we use through chemotherapy, um, instead you'd have small robots that are attacking um, based on biological identifiers. And then there's also the aspect of repair. So if you have a artery or something inside your body that has built up something it shouldn't have inside your body, then there could be robots that would actually uh, repair and remove. And so now, you know, we use surgery. We cut people up and, and take parts of, uh, you know, your veins and redirect the path of, of, uh, of blood in order to make your body still work. But it, with nanorobotics, I think actually there's potential to actually remove harmful substances. Okay, that's up against D, the water producer. So Dean Kamen, he's, who's most well known for the uh, inventor of the Segway, has all sorts of inventions. And, you know, he has created something that actually can take a bunch of terror, uh, wastewater almost, you know, filthy water from, from streams and ponds and so forth and actually purify it to make it drinkable. 
So I think, uh, and you know, desalination certainly is a huge problem in the world, and we uh, definitely need ways to take all of the water. There's so much water in the world that is unused that a small portion of that could be used for fresh water, particularly in areas where there's massive shortages. People are investing in water. I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but people are, companies are making huge investments in, in water really to take advantage of a market, in my opinion, that where there are shortfalls. Okay, so C is up against D. Okay, d use your one criterion, determine your winner. And uh, once you determine your winner, you're going to go to the next bracket and you're going to take the winner of that. So you're going to figure out who's in your final four. So go ahead and do that. Okay, so now I'm going to the second bracket. Four more careers. Here's a telepathic engineer. You can see that uh, now people are using brain function to transfer into actions of robots. I think that's becoming more and more advanced. In the movies, certainly the most advanced is the ability to have some kind of telepath your mind and actually operate within somebody in a hostile environment. You can imagine for uh, uh, exploration in the world going deep space, you can think that, hey, maybe we can, I can be a diver going down into um, under, uh, deep underwater, or I can be an astronaut going into space or have the ability to do space travel um, by not risking putting my body in harm's way, but rather some robot, but I can actually still experience visually what's going on. So I think a telepathic engineer will be able to do that. I think uh, people are developing the capacity to grow organs. So as people think about transplants, uh, I think it will, become, it will come from their own DNA uh, more than actually relying on a deceased person who is donating an organ. So A is now pitted up against B, completely different careers. Which one do you think will be most important based on your one criterion? Take your vote. And now I'm going to go to C, a genetic life specialist. So most of the time we go to the doctor and we want to get a sense of our bio uh, uh, susceptibilities. We get our blood pressure checked. We do blood tests. Uh, those are the uh, current measures. I believe that your genetic profile and understanding genetic mutations through different algorithms, um, so this is where computer science plays a huge role, will influence someone to become a specialist who will be able to offer advice and treatment um, solely based on your genetic profile. And then that's up against the air quality neutralizer. That is the ability to create clean air or to remove toxic conditions in the environment. I believe, uh, well, most people talk about this being a significant problem, and I believe the technology will advance to be able to do either or. All right, so you have your second bracket. So now you're thinking your one criterion, C is up against D, and then once you have your winner, go to your final four and figure out who's going to be the uh, winner of the final four. All right, so you have now two, two of your careers in your final four. Here's the next bracket, third bracket. All right, your risk analytics advisor. The easiest way to describe that is having C-3PO at your side. That's someone who is uh, going to uh, uh, either a robot or a machine that will constantly evaluate scenarios and give you some feedback on whether or not that's a good idea. Someone will make decision-making a lot easier for you. And that's up against a uh, genetic engineer. There are genetic engineers already. Uh, I think it'll go to a more extreme level on creating unique foods, creating a pet unicorn, uh, maybe creating a dinosaur, I don't know. But I believe that genetic engineering and the ability to um, create things that are living uh, will be more and more possible. Certainly, uh, some valuable genetic engineering would be to use salt water to harvest all sorts of uh, food 
in areas where there's a shortage of food while removing the salt as a residue in the growing process. That would be ultra cool. Okay, so those two careers are up against each other. And now see the personal assistant app developer. So now our app development is in programming in uh, a handheld tool. I think that actually you'll have a uh, robotic assistant who you gradually will train to do more and more things. In fact, as it gets trained to do more and more things through its own experience, it will become more advanced at what it does. So, you know, robot, you know, through uh, some machine learning, artificial intelligence techniques, robots will be able to acquire more and more sophistication in their advancement through exposure and through collecting data from different sensors. Okay, so that's up against uh, the continuous cognitive evaluator. So right now, uh, people's understanding is done uh, and evaluated in a, at a very slow rate. So, for example, when you're learning in a class, you don't know how you're doing most often until you take a test. And that only happens periodically. I think a, uh, a better approach would be for people to get feedback more rapidly on, hey, you understand this and you don't understand this. So why don't you focus on what you don't understand and spend more time on that? And I think that will be more continuous so that you'll have some kind of device or someone's responsible for creating a device that will actually tell you exactly what you know and what you don't know and where you need to spend your time. Okay, so C is up against D. Two totally different careers. Use your, your criterion to figure out which one's best. All right, now we're gonna go into the fourth bracket and then we're gonna like vote. So here's our fourth bracket. <clears throat> Sensor response systems engineers. So these are people who are designing sensors that will enable objects never to touch anything and keep them out of harm's way, or will develop sensors that will intentionally create objects to touch. So you can imagine for military purposes, you want objects to touch uh, and to happen remotely to keep, uh, you know, to um, be able to operate objects remotely so that you don't have people on the ground uh, putting themselves in harm's way, and then certainly there's a lot of talk right now for the last 10 years on developing an autonomous vehicle. But I don't think it's about just an autonomous vehicle, you know, making your car drive on its own. I think it's actually a lot of different possible devices to operate uh, autonomously. You know, you can have someone go shopping for you. I, I mean, there's all sorts of things that can happen if the right sensors are built in. All right, uh, that's up against the synthetic organism engineer. Uh, be, uh, I think that we're starting to get advancements in that, and that's the ability to create things that look realistic but aren't real. For example, having a pet dog that you never have to walk. Right? You don't have to worry about it like having bodily functions. Or uh, certainly, as we see in Star Trek data, the doctor who's able to evaluate people um, and, um, you know, it's just essentially an android life form. Okay, so A is up against B. So now we're going to see the memory biographer. Imagine, so you have memories of distinct things from your childhood. Imagine if you can actually portray that on a, uh, as a, in an actual visual cue. I think as we understand brain function uh, more, that those, you have memories. You remember how things look right? People or certain things that you loved. You, rem you have that stored in your memory, and I believe actually we'll be able to project that onto an image. And that's up against uh, the hardware security specialist. Uh, right now, uh, as we talk about the Internet of Things, everything ultimately, or most uh, devices, most hardware, will have the ability to communicate with each other, and they don't necessarily do that at someone's direction. They'll start doing this more autonomously. And so people will become more concerned about the safety of everything that they own that has an on switch. And so there will be people needed to protect it. You know, right now that people talk about like cybersecurity and protecting your computer and protecting malicious software that goes onto your phone or whatever. I think this is gonna happen with any object that has an on switch. Okay, so C is up against D. Fill out your bracket. And then you make that go up against A and B, and I think I've covered all 16, so then we're going to get to the voting. All 
All right, so we're going to go, oops, that's the first bracket here. So we're going to go up to the first bracket, okay? So whoever is in your Final Four matchup in the first bracket, uh, you're going to hold up uh, your, whichever one was the winner, A, B, C, or D. And I need, uh, 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 Bryn, can I get your help? Everyone's going to hold up A, B, C, or D for your first bracket, and we're going to figure out what the most popular choice was. And everyone's going to keep score based on your own criterion. Yeah, everyone's going to show up A, B, C, and D on their first bracket. And we're going to try and look at the audience. I don't have a, a fancy uh, program to, I, actually, I should have done that, just to scan the audience. There is, there is an app that you can just scan the audience and figure out where people are voting. All right, anyone in the back want to vote? If you vote, you can win a prize. How are we doing here? All right, what do you think? They are kind of spread out. Uh, it's be okay, if you have B or C, put your papers down. It's going to be between A and D. So let me, let's take a look at the A's and the D's. What do you think? There's a lot more A? Okay, so A is, a is the winner of the first bracket. So your cognition and memory enhancer is uh, the first one. And I'll need, uh, can you do me a favor and like circle that so we remember? Anywhere, just so that. Yeah, because we have to have a winner. We have to walk out of here as a, with a winner, right? All right, so here's, here's bracket two. So uh, now we're at bracket two. Who is your final four person? Raise, raise it up. If you didn't have, uh, we have extra A's, B's, and C's, and D's. All right. I can see, I can read your hands. That's good. Uh, I can't read all the way in the back. What did you have all the way in the back? Oh, some people are writing. If, we, if they need, some people in the back may need some handouts. Okay, A's, B's, C's, and D's. Uh, I'm thinking uh, D, right? You think D? Yeah. yeah, D, definitely. D is the winner of that bracket. The air quality neutralizer. Yeah, just identify. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here we go, the third bracket. So go ahead and raise. Third bracket, go ahead and raise what you had. All right, what do you think? I think it's B, right? B, yeah? Yeah, B, definitely. So the third bracket, B, the genetic engineer. All right, fourth bracket. Fourth bracket, here we go. What do you think, Bryn? Well, this is tough. It's either going to be C or, or, is it, oh boy, C or D, right? Yeah. If you had A or B, put it down. We want to count the difference between C's and D's. C's and D's. Yeah, D. Okay, so D is the winner of that one. Okay, so now, here's a chance to advocate, okay? So, out of those four, you probably have one that you're super passionate about, right? So go ahead and you make your prediction now on who's the winner out of those four. And um, we're going to call those A, B, C, and D. So the first bracket is A. So it's the, uh, let me review them again. The, uh, out of bracket A, we have the cognition and memory enhancer. Out of bracket B, we have the air quality neutralizer. Out of bracket C, we have uh, the genetic engineer. And out of bracket D, we have the hardware security specialist. So you're going to choose among those four careers. Again, it's uh, out of bracket A, you would choose job cognition and memory enhancer. Out of bracket B, it would be the air quality neutralizer. Out of bracket C, you have the genetic engineer. And out of bracket D, you have the hardware security specialist. Okay? So you're going to think to yourself, now, um, you get more points if those are still in your bracket, but you can still get, you know, we still want people to predict, okay? So if this was part of your original final four, you know, you're, and you choose the winner, then you get a prize. Um, all right, so now we're going to have people advocate. So let's hear from the audience why you feel um, the job of uh, job cognition and memory enhancer is really great.
So does anyone want to advocate for that? The, the cognition of memory enhancer. Okay, go ahead. There is already a lot of research going on on memory functions, and uh, I think it's not too far. We will figure out how we remember things and how they are important for uh, reinforcement learning and uh, uh, success in life. And since it is so uh, related to our own efficiency and performance, this is going to be a very hot topic of interest. Okay, fantastic. All right, let's give this gentleman a round of applause for giving his point of view. All right, all right. Who uh, who here feels that the air quality neutralizer is essential? All right, here, go ahead. Explain why. Um, I think that a lot of people are are worried about about the environment and that our air air is not like clean. And I think that that people who create um, like clean air will be, be very important because they, they um, because they, they will help people like well like in China they have lots of smog and stuff and then they need clean air and yeah. Great, fantastic. Let's, let's give a round of applause. All right. So then round uh, the, the seat. So you can change your mind, by the way. You're hearing these ideas. You can change your mind. So see the genetic engineer. Who wants to advocate about the importance of being a genetic engineer in the future? There are so many uncurable diseases that are um, hereditary. And if you could edit the DNA of, say, a child before it's born, you could... Um, give them immunity to Alzheimer's, or give them super strength, and do so many things, and so many diseases could be prevented, and I think that's really important. All right, and then our last category is the uh, hardware security specialist. So I'm advocating for this one because I think um, as our lives become more and more revolving around technology, um, like Dr. Glazer said, anything with an on and off switch can be controlled by someone else. So essentially anything you rely on to live your life, um, someone else can start living your life for you um, and controlling your life. And if we like, combine medical things with technology, then someone can control you. So that's my... That's my uh, Fantastic. All right. So here's our final vote. So the, all the, the four of you who volunteered to speak, at the end, you come up and you get a prize. You don't get a prize for per participating, okay? So thank you very much for doing that. Now we're going to get the final vote. So raise it if you want. Uh, you raise A if you think uh, your uh, ideal future uh, career for STEM would be job cognition or cognition and memory enhancer. You're going to put a B if you think it's a air quality neutralizer, C, a genetic engineer, and D, a hardware security specialist. All right, go ahead, put them up. Let's see the winner. Oh, boy. Here we go. All right, we got some people in the back. We got to count the people in the back. We're all voting for A, right? Holy smokes. Okay, so it's, it's between uh, what, A and B? What do you think? A and B. Yeah, yeah, so if you put C and D, Put, put your, uh, go down. So it's between A and B. It's between A and B. Let's count, let's, let me count the people at A and B. I think we're going to have to manually count this, right? Oh, no, no, wait. Two, three, five, six. No, I think B. B is the winner. B is the winner, the uh, air quality neutralizer. So, uh, we, uh, yes, congratulations to the people who selected B. So here's, here's how you win a prize. So our, our volunteers who, um, um, who, voice their opinion, they certainly can get a prize. And if uh, you voted for air quality neutralizer and it was in your final four, it has to be both, right? Then you also get a prize too. And I hope I have enough prizes, but I have a lot. But I think uh, if you've narrowed down your final four and that included air quality neutralizer and you voted for B, then come on up and get a prize. So I uh, share with you 16 possible careers. There's certainly a lot more careers. Uh, I hope our young minds in the audience and our older minds in our audience feel inspired on how the world will be a better place as a result of these careers. Thanks so much for coming and come on up and get your prize. <laughs>